Good morning, church family. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the chief shepherd and pastors and elders are the under shepherds. So if little Paxton says, uh, I'm an under coach, uh, I think, I think that's, that's, that's beautiful. And Jesus is obviously the head coach. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about some sports analogies later on in the sermon. Because um, we have a mission, we all have a mission. And I do see myself, you know, Ephesians 4 says the pastors, the teachers, they should be equipper of the saints for the ministry of the church. So I think, I think that applies. But we've been going through this series on 1 Corinthians, uh, written by the Apostle Paul. And I want you to think about how do you, how do you picture the Apostle Paul living in his day-to-day -day life? I think about Paul as a great theologian. You know, he's written these amazing letters, these amazing theological insights. So sometimes I, I think of Paul as like one of my seminary professors. This is just someone who is thinking and writing and talking with their colleagues. You know, and there, there's an aspect of where that's true. I also think of Paul as the, the great missionary traveler. So I, I think of him walking uh, on, you know, on foot and walking to all these places and, and traveling by sea and having campfires with his friends and, and eating good food along the way. I, I just, I picture Paul traveling. I also picture Paul as a great evangelist. You know, he w helped spread the gospel and Christianity to uh, around the world, the Mediterranean world. And so I picture him preaching the gospel and teaching in the synagogue and leading these amazing Bible studies and, and teaching people from the Old Testament who the Messiah, uh, Jesus, is. I picture all these things. Sometimes I think of him as a professional missionary, a, a pastor. And yes, sometimes he was financially supported for what he did, but a lot of the times he was not. He did this most of the time out of his own free will, out of his own accord, and an aspect of his life that we often forget is that Paul was a laborer, that he was a tradesman, that he spent long hours toiling and working in his task. He was a blue-collar businessman in addition to being a theologian and a missionary pastor. In fact, he wrote to the Thessalonians, Remember, brothers and sisters, our labor and toil, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. We worked night and day. And then here in Corinth, this was also, his practice was the same. And if you'd like to follow along this morning, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 9. And the first part of this chapter, Paul is essentially saying, you know, I did not charge you for my services. He says in verse 11, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Jumping down to verse 18. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. So Paul says to them, I'm not doing this for the money, and I'm completely independent from you. I am, I am free. I am, I am not a professional. But I am on mission everywhere I go to everyone I meet. And if there's one thing I want you to take away is this identity statement. I am on mission everywhere I go to everyone I meet. That is how Paul lived his life. It is a historical reality that the gospel of Jesus did not spread by the professionals. It spread by everyday believers in Christ whose lives had been so transformed they couldn't help share it at their workplace, in their neighborhood, in their, in their associations. They shared it everywhere. They saw themselves on mission everywhere they went to everyone they met. Friend, would you like to see more lives transformed by Christ. Gosh, that song we were singing earlier, you restore every heart that is broken. You are the light in the darkness. Don't we want to see more people experience this freedom that we have in Jesus? I was hoping I'd get at least an amen on that one right there. <laughs> we want that, right? Amen? Well, I presume that you did. But if you want to see that, it's going to take every believer, every person in our church, every one of us, 
seeing ourselves on mission everywhere we go to everyone we meet. That's what it takes for the gospel to spread. And so in this sermon, I'm going to be very simple. I'm going to be very application-focused. I'm going to give you some tangible reminders of how we all can live on mission. And I'll, I'll say up front, it's much easier to say it's a lot harder to do. But I, hopefully this sermon will remind us, and, and, and we all have room to grow in this area, myself included. But let's be reminded this morning and encouraged to live on mission. So this is really a how-to. How, how can we live on mission everywhere we go to everyone we meet? So number one is we are going to serve everyone. We will serve everyone. If you want to jump down to verse 19, Paul says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Scott McKnight translates this phrase as being liberated from all, I enslaved myself to all. To me, this is one of those crazy Paul thoughts. Like, what? This is so radical and, and frankly kind of uncomfortable that the people around me, have. Been, I'm making them my master. I'm saying I am willing to see what needs they have and meet those needs. The catch is this is a free choice. This is chosen by Paul. I am a free person. I'm liberated by Jesus, but I'm freely choosing to enslave myself to all. I will be a servant of all. And this is exactly the radical mindset of Jesus Christ. Being fully and freely God, he chose to become one of us. He said he came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life, his very life, as a ransom for many. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. A servant who seeks to meet needs. What if we viewed evangelism fundamentally as service? What if we asked, what does my neighbor need and how can I meet that need? What if we asked as a church, what does our community need? And how can we meet that need? You know, Jesus, he went around proclaiming the kingdom, the, the gospel, but he also demonstrated it by healing people, helping people, going around doing good. Can we not follow his example? Can we not follow his teachings when he said, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying the, the fundamental way that we shine the light of Christ is by the good that we do to the people around us, by serving them, helping them. And friends, this is not for the professionals. This is for everyone. The, I've told you the story many times, but the, 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 the guy who led me to Christ when I was in junior high, um, he was an ordinary person. He was not a professional. In fact, he reminds me, he's not here this morning, but he reminds me of Dan Huttenlock in our church. He was a middle school teacher by trade, and a cross-country coach. And he gave up his times in the summer to go spend a couple weeks at a covenant camp so that he could speak to teenagers. And when I heard the way he presented the gospel, I chose to come to Christ. He was not a professional. He was an ordinary believer in Christ. I told you before about my confirmation men mentor, Bob Ribby, a retiree about in the 70s, taking me out to a diner to talk about what I was learning. You know, when I was a youth pastor out of college, we had a, a young teenage girl who lived in a very broken home and a family of all atheists. But she was curious about Jesus, and she knew some of the people in our youth group, and she started coming to our group. Um, and our group was, I was the professional. I was getting paid to do this. But everybody else in the youth ministry was not. These were ordinary folks with, with full-time jobs and families, and they gave up their time. They gave up weekends, believe it or not. They gave up whole weekends and weeks in the summer to spend time with our youth. And it was, I think those were the primary relationships that helped her trust in some Christians, which ultimately led her to trusting in Christ. And I still follow her on uh, Facebook to this day, and she's, she's now a mother of three. Uh, she's a, a, attending a, a different church now, but she is still very involved and active in serving, and she loves the Lord, and her life has been so radically transformed 
because of Jesus. But it started with ordinary people who helped her come to trust Christ. Laura and I have a friend in our neighborhood who decided to join the local PTA. That just sounds, I'm sorry, like, whoa, like a lot of meetings. And, but she wanted to do so because she wanted to have an influence where she could find opportunities where she might be able to be on mission and share the gospel. And so she's giving up her time. She does, she's not a professional, but she's an ordinary believer seeking to be on mission. There are many ways, many of you, many, uh, many ways that we can see our workplaces, our, our neighborhoods, our lives as a mission field. But the key is to be looking for needs around us and meeting them in Jesus' name. Sometimes the needs may be obvious, you know, like immigrants and refugees moving to our community and those who help them resettle and learn the English language. And by the way, thank you to everyone in our church who's involved in an aspect of that ministry. It's a wonderful way to demonstrate the gospel. But what do we do about those invisible needs? To be honest with you, this is something I, I struggle, live, uh, struggle with living where I do, around kind of this, especially this affluent Arrowhead neighborhood. Like, what are the needs of my neighbors? They drive really nice cars. They live in really nice homes. They don't even need the public playground. They have one in their backyard. You know, like, what, what do they need? And as, as I've been reflecting on that, you know, these people, they're just as lost and precious to God as anybody else. How about those who, despite busy careers and schedules, are lonely and isolated? How about parents whose kids are going through immense difficulties? How about materialism that leads to an empty way of life? How about those struggling with grief, loss, divorce? How about those caught in invisible sins but lead to living a life of shame and secrecy? And here's a key insight I had about this. Meeting these real invisible needs can't be accomplished by a handout. It can't be accomplished by a project. It can only be accomplished through relationship. That's the only way you're going to know what your friends and neighbors and colleagues are dealing with is if you have a relationship with them, a trusting relationship where they can tell you what's really going on. And honestly, frankly, that's one of the biggest needs people around us have is relationship. So can we serve someone by choosing to be their friend? Can we serve someone by giving them a listening ear? Can we serve someone by inviting a colleague out to lunch? We can serve people with our time and our attention. I'm on mission everywhere I go to everyone I meet. But this is going to require friends adapting to the various people and the various needs around you. That's what we're, number two, how we're going to do this is we're going to meet people where they are. We're going to meet people where, where they are. This is a very simple way of saying that we must contextualize our ministry to the context. It's a simple way of saying that we are to be incarnational like Jesus, that who came to be among us, he lived among us, he came to, to live a human life like we did. And Paul, in a similar way, he adapted himself to meet people where they were, to win as many as possible. This is verse 20. He says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Now, this is really a strange and interesting phrase coming from a Jewish person. What? I, I, he's already Jew. I became like a Jew. What is he talking about? Now, some scholars say this phrase, becoming like the Jews, this is in reference to Paul maintaining his relationship to the synagogues. And remember how in the book of Acts, this was one of his main strategies. I'm going to go. He went to the synagogue first, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. But the problem with that is that Paul kept on preaching the gospel of Jesus in the synagogues. He kept on preaching the, the Messiah. And so the penalty for blasphemy, which they considered it, was that he'd have to be punished in some way, often with whipping. And so he received 39 lashes on five different occasions. And some scholars suggest that Paul choosing to undergo this discipline allowed him to maintain connection to the synagogue, that they didn't kick him out of the synagogue, 
because he was willing to submit to the punishment of the synagogue. Does that make sense? David Garland talks about this in his commentary, that Paul's willingness to undergo this suffering was so that he could maintain his gospel witness and keep on preaching in the synagogues. Now that is missional commitment. That is missional commitment. He maintained these relationships at great personal cost. The next phrase, he says, I became like one under the law. Now this is about keeping up Jewish practices, Jewish food laws, other ritual ceremonies. And although Paul knew that he was free from all of that in Christ, Maintaining these practices among the Jews gave him an audience with them so that he could share Christ with them. Next, he says in verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like one uh, having the law, like not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. Paul is talking about his freedom, his freedom in Christ. He he can forsake these Jewish boundary markers. He can forsake the Jewish food laws. He could eat at table with the Gentiles, which would have been taboo for many reasons. And Paul clarifies this is not about encouraging lawlessness, but it's missional ad adaptation. Paul is saying, no, we're not, we're not adopting sinful practices in order to reach sinners. That's not what he's saying. We don't compromise on sin. But we are, he says, we are under the law of Christ. But these old covenant stipulations, these, these boundary markers and things that separate us from the Gentiles, these no longer hold sway. And we can, should go as far as we can within reason to reach the nations, the Gentiles, with the gospel. Sometimes, friends, that means meeting people in unsavory places. You know, Jesus, he was accused of hanging around with the wrong crowd. He was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. He was accused of doing the wrong things with the wrong kinds of people. But he was in places and with people who needed the light. Would anyone ever accuse you of the same thing? You're in places and with people who need the light. Finally, Paul says in verse 22, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. What does this refer to? Now, last week we talked about those with a weak conscience in relation to, if you were here, about the food sacrificed to idols. This is probably not what Paul is talking about right here, not to make it confusing. This, this could be about social status. Uh, Paul, as a, a free Roman citizen, as a brilliant Jewish scholar, a Pharisee, he was willing to associate with people and relate to people of all status the poor, the manual laborers, the slaves, men and women, etc. That was part of his gospel. But I think there's a sense in which this can also go beyond just mere social status, where we connect on a human level with people through our weakness, through our weaknesses. Because when people know that you're broken and you struggle just like them, oh, how that binds you in a connection. To live on mission, we must become vulnerable to the vulnerable. Vulnerable to the vulnerable. Becoming vulnerable with people through our weaknesses helps us connect with others and helps us tell them about the power of Christ in our lives, in our weaknesses. And this is counter, I think, to ways that we think about sharing our faith. You know, we say, you know, I, I once was weak. I once had all these issues. I once had all this sin in my life. And now... Look at what Jesus has done. Right? Isn't that some of the ways we were taught to share the gospel? Before, I was like, and not to discount, many of us have had significant transformation. Amen? I know I have. But I also know that even today, I have many weaknesses, many trials, and many things that I need the power of Christ, which is very present and active in my life. In every, remember when Paul, he was put in prison, and he writes to the church in Philippi, and he basically he says, don't worry about me. Don't fret about the situation. What has happened to me is actually caused to advance the gospel, not hinder it. They thought they could chain up the gospel, but no, it's actually spreading all the more. Wow. This trial, this very, let's not minimize how difficult prison was back in Paul's day. This would have been horrible to experience, but he says this 
has caused to advance the gospel. So I don't want to minimize our trials, but every trial, every difficulty we go through is an opportunity for God to use us to spread the gospel through our weakness. And some of you, you've, you've gone through some real difficulties, you've gone through some really significant challenges, and yet Christ has sustained you. Christ has provided for you. Christ has surrounded you with his church, throwing his arms around you. And if it wasn't for Christ, you wouldn't be where you are today. Amen? Amen. We share the gospel through our weaknesses. To the weak, I have become weak. What trials, what setbacks, what difficulties might God want to use in your life to help share the good news of Jesus with someone else? We meet people where they're at. We're on mission everywhere we go to everyone we meet. And we're going to do that, number three, by using all possible means. Now again, for much of Paul's ministry, uh, he did not have an elaborate professional strategy. He was a regular worker. I like what Kenneth Birding writes. He says, we should probably picture Paul as carrying just enough tools and supplies in his bag to allow him either to sit on a stool or squat beside a busy street while sol solving people's diverse textile or leather problems, whether related to tents or canopies or sandals or, or whatever came his way, all the while seeking to share the good news about a resurrected Christ with whoever would listen. See, Paul, he talked to people about Christ through his work, not in spite of it. It wasn't so much that, you know, sometimes we think of Paul as the tent maker. Well, I've got to make all this money so I can fund my mission work. No, his work was his mission work. In so many ways, he's talking to people as he's working and making money and doing those things. And so, friends, there is no division between sacred work and secular work. It is all God's work. It is all God's work. And where, everywhere we go, we carry this light of Christ with us. So, friend, remember, your workplace, it's a mission field. Your home, amongst your kids and your family, it's a mission field. Your neighborhood is a mission field. And you are sent on mission. And all your spiritual gifts, all your knowledge, all the education you received, all the resources you have, your unique personality, your passions, these are all possible means in which to employ them for the sake of the gospel. You know, one of my mentors uh, in my doctoral program, he loves to ride a, a bike for exercise. And several years back, he decided to join a, a cycling group because he wanted to build relationships with people who didn't know the Lord. And he also was a person who liked to ride his bike. And through that, he's developed several friendships with people where he's been able to share about Christ and, and um, his faith. So friends, I want to encourage you, take something you already do. Take something you're already interested in and use it as a means to share the gospel. If you like to golf, use golf to spread the gospel. If you like working with arts and crafts, use it for the sake of the gospel. If you like board games, use it for the gospel. If you like sports, either playing or watching, use it for the gospel. If you like to read, use that for the gospel. If you like to exercise and go to the gym and ride a bike or play basketball or go running, use it for the gospel. If you like being outside in the woods, use it for the gospel. What things do you like to do that you could use for the gospel? What is something you're already doing that the Lord might use as a means to build a connection with somebody else who needs Jesus? You know, one of the things that I, I'm working on and I, and I practice is I, I, I try to be a regular at a few different restaurants. And you'll often find me uh, throughout the week working over at Panera in Donata. Yeah, Panera's good, right? Yeah, amen. That's, I see Stephanie there all the time and other people. And um, it's been good. I, I, I take what I already need to do. I need to do some admin work or I need to finish up a sermon. And through that, I'm meeting people. I'm building friendships. I'm building relationships. And I, I've had some opportunities to talk about my faith with, with the people who are there. And it's taking something I already need to do. I already want to do anyway. I like a good cup of coffee. Can I use that in a little way to be a little bit more missional? We have to think strategically and intentionally with these things. 
Paul says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means, all possible means, I might save some. Isn't that a, 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 almost a weird dichotomy? All things, all people, all possible means, I might save some. <laughs> right? But friends, it's a reminder that one, we don't control the outcome. We're not guaranteed any results. That's in God's hands. That's up to the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. It's not in our timing. It's not in our agenda. And it's also a reminder that this gospel is so valuable, that Jesus is so amazing. It's worth expending all means in all situations, even if there's just a possibility it might save some. That's how important it is. There's no guaranteed result. And even so, Paul says, I use all possible means that I might save some. Oh, isn't that beautiful? It's so worth it. It's so worth it. The salvation of every soul is so worth it. Paul says in verse 23, I do this all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings, or it can be translated, or become a partner in it, a partner in the gospel work. Becoming a partner in this good news is kind of like maybe becoming a partner in an investment firm. The word win is used five times in this passage. Winning people to God, which is equated with their salvation. And N.T. Wright says this word win, it's, it's used not so much of winning a prize, but of making significant profit on an investment. God has invested everything in the gospel, including his own very self in the person of Jesus, his son. Now he wants to gain something back from it, namely the people of all sorts and conditions whose lives will be won through the gospel. Again, I told you before, one of my most significant moments for me on sabbatical was getting to go to family camp with my family at Portage Lake. And our speaker for the week, Pastor Bob Hoy, he's a, he's a covenant pastor. And him and I were having a, a personal kind of one-to-one -one conversation on the side. You know, and he's, I don't know how old he is, maybe 70-something. Uh, but he's still living on mission. He's still living so much for Jesus. And, and he said to me, you know, Nate, I'm just trying to live in such a way that Jesus gets a good return on the investment he's made in my life. And he's invested so much. I think about the same for myself. Not only we can think about the fact that Jesus died and gave everything, and rose again. That should be enough, right? That should be enough. But I think about all these people, these ordinary believers that God used to bring me to salvation, that God used to grow me up in the faith. I think about the educational opportunities I've had. I think about my undergrad and seminary and my experience here. And God has invested so much in me, so much in me. Am I living in such a way he's going to get a good return? Think about your own life. How much has God invested in you? He's invested in everything. And he keeps on investing in you. Is he going to get a good return on his investment? Are you living in such a way he's getting a return on what he's invested? Friends, we are on mission everywhere to everyone we meet. And then finally... We're going to live this out personally. We're going to live this out personally. Hopefully no surprise to you, Paul gives one of my favorite metaphors in all scripture. It's about running. Don't you know the, all, the, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Friends, this is a race that we're all running in. You know, many of us just watch the Olympics. Many of you, I know you're going to go home and turn on football this afternoon. And we're watching people who sacrifice so much, so much, their whole lives, their time, their diets, their, they hire professional coaches and dietitians. they invest everything they can for the opportunity, for the potential that they might win. And they're doing it for a, a temporary crown that will not last. Can we not sacrifice and run in such a way as to get the prize for Christ? Doesn't, th doesn't this prize, doesn't it, isn't it so much more valuable than anything they're competing for? 
This is the most valuable thing. And so it calls for our sacrificial love and commitment to run this race in the, for Christ. So what needs, what needs to change in you in order for you to run the race in such a way as to win? Let the Holy Spirit speak. Let's be on mission everywhere we go to everyone we meet. How are we going to do it? We're going to serve everyone. We're going to meet people where they, are, where they are. We're going to use all possible means, and we're going to live it out ourselves. And friends, if you need a simple way to think about this or remember these things, our denomination encourages, encourages you to think about five missional practices that we call bless. It stands for begin with prayer. We listen to people. We eat with them. We serve them. We share our story and the story of Christ. And every year, some of you, many of you have been here for this, we write down names and bookmarks and we, we pray for these people. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, as we talked about this as, as a staff and leadership, it kind of feels like a one and done thing sometimes. Like, okay, we did it, now that's done, and we don't really ever bring it up with you again. And like, that's, that's not good. That's not good of us. Um, and so we've talked, we want to intentionally do a better job of weaving, weaving bless in the people we're praying for into the life and culture of our church. And so I'm going to actually invite you to respond to two questions uh, to, share, to share with the church. You're going to submit uh, who in your life you're praying for. Even though we, you might have done this in the spring, I'm going to ask you to do it again. Who are you praying for who needs Christ in their life? And I'm going to ask you an additional question. Are there areas of mission you're involved in outside the walls of the church that we could be praying for you uh, on or supporting you in? And it's, what we're going to do is, instead of just passing these names on to the denomination where we don't think about them again or hear about it again, we are going to have that information on file with the church. And we're going to incorporate these names, first names only, into Life at Faith, into how we're praying weekly as a church, into prayers on Sunday morning, uh, into prayers in other groups and other avenues. And additionally, if you submit these names, Pastor Zach is going to reach out to you uh, about once a month. Uh, with a reminder to keep praying, and with some information to equip you in thinking about your own personal outreach and evangelism. And we believe that that is going to help you and be a catalyst as we equip all of us to live on mission every day. And friends, there's nothing like a common mission that unites a team together. We want to be uncommonly united around the mission of God.